Hi, um, welcome to today's OVSSR Director's Webinar titled Innovative Approaches to Understanding Eating Disorders. I'm Christine Hunter, the Acting Director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research at the National Institutes of Health. Before I introduce today's speaker, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available in about a month on the OBSSR website at obssr.od.nih.gov and you should be able to find that information in the chat so you can copy that down. Today's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. Um, all attendees are muted during the webinar and the chat feature is disabled. Questions and comments will be taken uh, via the Zoom's question and answer feature. So not the chat feature, the question and answer feature. To ask a question or send a comment, click on Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen, type in your question, and then send. You have the option to like other questions to avoid duplicate posts, and the most liked questions will move to the top. Feel free to send a question at any time during the webinar. We'll be monitoring that continuously. Following the presentation, OBSSR's Dr. Erica Spots will facilitate the question and answer session and ask your questions to the presenter. And so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Cynthia Bulick. Dr. Bulick's clinical work and research on eating disorders spans decades and continents. As founder and co-chair of the Eating Disorders Working Group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, she leads the global effort to identify actionable genomic variation in eating disorders. Dr. Bulick is principal investigator of the Global Eating Disorders Genetic Initiative funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. The groundbreaking Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative is the latest and <clears throat> the largest global research study on the genetics of eating disorders ever connect, conducted. The initiative aims to identify the hundreds of genes that influence a person's risk of developing anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder, with the goal to improve treatment and ultimately save lives. She also serves as senior faculty on the SAMHSA-funded National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders the national authoritative source for information and training in eating disorders. Dr. Bulick is dedicated to mentorship of junior investigators, especially women in STEM fields, and is passionate about translating science for the public. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Bulick to present today on innovative approaches to understanding eating disorders. So I turn the floor over to you, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Hunter, and I'm really happy to be here today with all of you. Um, and as she mentioned in the introduction, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about EDGY, but I'm gonna also give you some background um, and underscore from the very beginning that we're not just talking about genes, we are very much talking about genes and environment as they influence risk for eating disorders. Now, the work that you're gonna hear about today is spread over two centers. So I have the center at UNC Chapel Hill, the UNC Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders, and a center at Karolinska Institutet in Stockholm, Sweden, the Center for Eating Disorders Innovation. And of course, um, Dr. Hunter already mentioned NSEED, UNC Chapel Hill also serves as the, um, the base for the National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders, which is directed by Christine Peet and Jean Doak. So lots of great information on the NSEED website, um, especially for prim primary care physicians looking for more information about eating disorders. A couple of disclosures, um, was a grant recipient and on the advisory board for Shira Pharmaceuticals, um, and a textbook author for Pearson, and a member of the clinical advisory board for Equip Health. And this is my gratitude quilt. Um, on the top, you see the National Institute of Mental Health and the Swedish Research Council, um, who have funded a lot of the research that you'll be hearing about today as well as the Klarman Family Foundation who funded the precursor to EDGY. So here's the map. I will walk with you through this, this sort of series of topics. First, the genetics of eating disorders landscape. Second, understanding the current results. Third, talking a little bit about genes in the clinic. And fourth, what's happening now. I wish I could just erase everybody's memories of what they think they've ever learned about eating disorders because much of what you've learned has probably been wrong. And the misinformation that still is prevalent in our society, it harms patients and families, it actually stunts the science in some ways, and it definitely hinders treatment, especially detection and intervention in people who don't fit the classic stereotype of someone you think might have an eating disorder. 
And I stopped putting this slide up for a while, but I brought it back again because it's just so important. Gloria Steinem, who's one of my sort of hmm, role models in the field, in any field, said this, the first problem for all of us, men and women, is not to learn, but to unlearn. And it feels like so much of my life has been spent trying to get people to unlearn myths about eating disorders. So let's just start broadly with the topography of feeding and eating disorders for those of you who know less about it. So I'll start out with anorexia nervosa marked by low weight, intense fear of weight gain, and an inability to recognize the seriousness of the low weight. Bulimia nervosa, presence of binge eating coupled with regular compensatory behaviors and really seen across the, the weight span. Binge eating disorder, same in terms of behaviorally has the binge eating that you see in bulimia nervosa, but in the absence of those compensatory behaviors, distress over the binge eating and frequent occurs in individuals who are in the overweight or obese range. And avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, sort of the new kid on the block, um, a severe feeding disturbance marked by refusal or fear, um, nutritional deficiencies, weight loss or failure to gain weight. And if we look across sort of what we know just broadly from epidemiological perspective, anorexia occurs in about one to 4% of the population with a very high standardized mortality ratio of 5.4 to six. Distribution is strongly on the side of women being more frequently affected than men. Um, although part of that actually reflects the fact that our diagnostic criteria were built around cases that were seen in women. The heritability is about 60% on average, and we do have one genome-wide significant genome-wide genome um, association study, or GWAS, which we'll be talking about. It's actually more than one, but it comes in a series of steps. Bulimia, epidemiology, one to two percent, um, and uh, mortality about 1.5. Again, the distribution is more common in females than males. It's got that same problem with the diagnostic criteria being built around cases as they were seen in women. Heritability is also around 50 to 60%, and we don't have any genome-wide uh, genome association studies yet. Binge eating disorder, one to 4%, um, elevated mortality as well, a little bit more equal um, sex ratio or gender ratio, um, heritability around 45%, no genome-wide significant genome-wide association studies. And ARFID, um, we think it's about one to 4% in the population, don't really have great mortality statistics yet, um, some studies suggest might actually be more common in males than females, and the heritability, finally, we have an estimate, I'll tell you about that in the next slide, um, which actually places it around 67%. And we'll go right there. Um, this is a study that Lisa Dinkler, one of my postdocs in Sweden, just performed, because we were really interested in starting a GWAS of ARFID, but appropriately so, um, NIMH and some other funding bodies said, why should we do a GWAS in ARFID if we don't even know if the disorder is heritable? So she went to the child and adolescent twin study in Sweden, um, 34,000 twins um, created from, um, given the phenotyping that had already been done, before ARFID was even a disorder and created the phenotype of ARFID and linked it to the amazing population health registers in Sweden. And she was able to derive the first heritability estimate for ARFID, um, which as you can see in the red circle is about 67%, which places ARFID amongst the most heritable psychiatric phenotypes. Um, so I think we have clear data now that ARFID is indeed heritable and it does make sense to move forward with GWASs of ARFID. So just again, focusing on the landscape, this is a study done by former postdoc at UNC, Catherine Schaumburg, now at the University of Wisconsin, um, looking at how eating disorders fluctuate or diagnostic migration across time. And if you look at the darker circles on the left, that's first presentation of an eating disorder in Sweden. When you present for treatment for the first time, you get entered into a national register and then they follow you over time through the course of your illness. And as you can see, with all the crisscrossing lines, um, anorexia doesn't necessarily stay anorexia over time. So some people progress to Edna, some people fortunately go into remission, some people develop bulimia and then on to BED. There's a lot of 
phenotypic change over time in these eating disorders. And that's super important to remember when we talk about um, genetic studies of eating disorders, because how do we account for that fluctuation um, versus the people who start off with one presentation and maintain that presentation over time? So why do we do this? What got me interested in the first place? Um, I think that in many ways, eating disorders defy bi biology. And the main one is that for people with anorexia nervosa, starvation is reinforcing. Most of us hate it. We don't enjoy being hungry. We get grumpy. Um, but for people with anorexia, it's actually a more pleasant state for them to be in. Hunger cues are dysfunctional, ac dysfunctional across the board for eating disorders. Maybe not in the beginning, but over time, they definitely become dysfunctional bodies revert to a negative settling point. I talk about this in anorexia nervosa where we can re-nourish someone um, who comes in with a really low body mass index, but as soon as they're discharged, their bodies tend to pull them back down to a low BMI. A perplexing hypermetabolic period during re-nourishment. As you re-nourish someone with anorexia nervosa, they go through an unpredictably long stage of just requiring so many calories in order to continue to gain weight or maintain their weight. And we don't really have an explanation for why that occurs. Fats are reversive to people with anorexia. Most people really like fat, especially if you sort of like mix it in with some sweets or some sugar. Um, but people with anorexia say they don't like the mouth feel, they don't like the body feel, and they don't like the taste of fats. And satiety cues are overridden. You know, what is it biologically that allows people with bulimia and binge eating disorder or anorexia of the binge purge subtype to override those satiety cues and continue to eat it, continue to eat? Do they not get those stop signs? Do they ignore them for so long that they no longer function? And in anorexia, activity is more reinforcing than food. And we have an animal model in which we can actually get to the point where mice or rats will run themselves to death, even if they're in the presence of their favorite high sugar, high fat food, which is often the inside stuffing of an Oreo. And studying eating disorders genetics doesn't just tell us about eating disorders genetics. It also gives us information about many comorbid disorders, major depression, anxiety disorders, OCD, about the genetics of obesity, about the genetics of metabolism. Um, there are all sorts of additional um, phenotypes that we learn about when we do eating disorders genetics. I just want to throw the term, the negative energy balance trap out now. We'll come back to it. So I mentioned this already, but negative energy balance is all about what you eat and how much you expend. Negative energy balance is when you're expending more energy than you're consuming. And people with anorexia nervosa just gravitate toward negative energy balance. It is their preferred state. Many people say that it's anxiolytic. So even if they're anxious at baseline, they say that they feel less anxious when they're in negative energy balance. And then for bulimia and binge eating disorder, even though we think about the binge eating behavior often, in between binge episodes, often people are in negative energy balance and that can perpetuate the cycle of binge eating. So if you haven't ever read the Academy for Eating Disorders, Nine Truths About Eating Disorders, it's worth a trip to their website to take a look. Um, this actually started for, with a talk that I gave at NIMH, I think in 2013, so a long time ago. Um, and it morphed into, instead of myths about eating disorder, truths about eating disorders. I think it's been translated into about 30 languages at this point. Um, and today we're gonna talk about truth seven and truth eight. Seven is genes and environment play important roles in the development of eating disorders. And eight is genes alone do not predict who will develop eating disorders. So we'll start with the basics of a genome-wide association study. Um, if you've done one of these before, if you know all about them, you can take a little rest. Um, basically, what I'm going to illustrate is that a genome-wide association study is a large study of cases and controls in which we genotype every person. And we slather like a million markers across the genome to say where are the, whoopsie, where are the differences between cases and controls? Um, and if you just look at this little cartoon, you can see right here, the cases tend to have a C, 
and the controls tend to have a T. And we do that for all of the different variants, basically to develop a, a genome-wide profile of how um, the cases and the controls and where they differ. And this is the output of the GWAS. It's called a Manhattan plot because if you're lucky and you have success and there really is a genetic component to your trait, um, all of these green bits above the red line start to look like the Manhattan skyline. And the way you read it is on the bottom are the human chromosomes. On, the, on this axis is the significance level. And we use a very stringent significant level. So not your usual P is less than 0.05 because we're doing a million comparisons. So the level that we're looking at is five times 10 to the negative eighth. And the reason we're so conservative is that false positives cost money and they cost time. Whenever we identify one of these loci that might be associated with a trait and decide that it's something to follow up to figure out, you know, what are the genes there and how do they work? And we invite our neuroscience coll colleagues in to sort of dig more deeply into that locus. It's a pretty important direction to go in and an expensive direction to go in. So we want to make sure that we're not chasing up false positives. And a lot of the work that you're seeing is part of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. There are over a thousand clinicians and researchers involved in the PGC now. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's the largest collaboration ever in psychiatry. And we are the eating disorders working group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. Um, we've been doing a lot of meeting virtually lately, but um, these are pictures when we've met at conferences around the world um, prior to the pandemic. And this was our first freeze. Um, so the way this works, and the most important thing to know about GWAS is, is sample sizes are everything. Um, we're expecting all of these complex traits that are psychiatric disorders to have hundreds and probably even thousands of genes that contribute to risk. And in order to detect genes of small effect size, you need to have large sample sizes. This was our first freeze in 2019. Um, you can see that Angie, or the Anorexia Nervosa Genetics Initiative that was funded by the Klarman Family Foundation, comprised the majority of cases in that freeze, about 74% of them. But all in all, we had almost 17,000 cases and 55,000 controls from 17 different countries, as you can see in the flags on the bottom. And this was our Manhattan-ish plot. Um, so not quite as exciting as the schizophrenia one I showed you in the example, um, but we had eight genome-wide significant hits. And I think the interesting thing about this is we could then take these hits and say, where else have these loci been implicated with what other traits or disorders? And as you can see across these hits, there was some overlap with other autoimmune traits, with metabolic traits, with neuropsychiatric traits, and then some with sex hormones as well. And this actually coincides quite well with what we've seen um, in terms of epidemiology. We've seen a lot of studies coming out of um, the, the Nordic countries that have shown associations between anorexia nervosa and autoimmune diseases. Um, but this was really the, the first and strongest evidence that we had um, from an anorexia nervosa GWAS. But that was only just part um, of what we found in that first study. And we talked about those sort of like skyscrapers that you saw above the red line, but there's also information below the red line. And the way I think to think about this is to project yourself into the future when our sample size might be 100,000 instead of the 17,000 that it was here. And think about the movement that you might see and some other little peaks that are gonna push themselves eventually above that red line that there's a way that we can still use or harvest that information below the red line to our advantage. Um, and I'm gonna talk briefly about genetic correlations, um, which are basically a way um, developed by Brendan Bulek Sullivan, um, a way that we can just use summary stats from other GWASs to identify genetic correlations between traits without those traits having to be measured on the same people. So in the past, we would have to do like twin studies where we had depression and anorexia both measured on the same individuals. This way I can take a GWAS that was done in the Netherlands and our anorexia GWAS, and by using summary statistics, ask the question, do any of the same genes, what proportion of the same genes actually influence both of those traits in the same direction 
or might they influence those traits in the opposite direction? So some of those same genes might increase your risk for anorexia, but actually decrease your risk for depression. And that's what we're gonna look at over the next several slides. This is just the overview slide, and then I'm gonna break it down to you. So to figure out how to read this or understand it, zero is up and down the middle. So that's no association. Anything to the right of that line is positive genetic correlation, which means the same genes are involved and it increases risk for both. And on the other side is a negative genetic correlation. So the same genes are involved, but although it may increase risk for anorexia nervosa, it may decrease risk for traits on that side. And now we'll pull this apart and look at it section by section. We're gonna start on the top right-hand side with genetic correlations between anorexia nervosa and psychiatric, educational, and physical activity phenotypes. So here, um, strongest correlations, and I'm only showing you the significant ones. We did hundreds of correlations, but these are only the ones that bubble to the top. Very strong, positive genetic correlations with obsessive compulsive disorder, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety, neuroticism. No surprise, this mirrors what we see in the clinic. But what it does is it gives us a reason for why we see these disorders together in the clinic, especially obs obsessive compulsive disorder, which is the strongest genetic correlation. Um, we see anorexia and OCD hand in hand all the time. And this result clarifies that one of the reasons we do that is because there are shared genetic factors between those two disorders. Likewise, if we go down a little bit further, we see these positive genetic correlations with um, educational attainment, three different measures of educational attainment. And yes, um, educational attainment does have a genetic component to it. It is heritable. And I think this makes people sort of rewrite some of the old myths about anorexia again, because often you see fairly high achieving people develop anorexia. And back in the day when there was parent blaming, it was always, oh, the parents put pressure on the child. And you know, that's one of the reasons they develop anorexia. Well, you know, guess what? Um, there's actually a positive genetic correlation between educational attainment and anorexia nervosa. So some of the co-occurrence of those two traits is due to shared genetic factors. And the same thing actually holds for physical activity. Um, if you've ever worked with people with anorexia nervosa, you'll know that a pretty large subset of them are very physically active. Even when they're close to death, they're still moving. Um, and as we said in the very beginning, we even have an animal model um, where animals will exercise themselves to death in the presence of palatable food. But this shows a positive genetic correlation between anorexia nervosa and physical activity. So some of the genetics, the genes that make them at increased risk for developing anorexia nervosa, they also contribute to why they're so physically active and may help us maybe understand and empathize more with why it's such a hard component of anorexia nervosa to treat. Now we're gonna go down a little bit more um, to the middle of that graph and we're gonna look at genetic correlations between anorexia and metabolic factors. And what you see here is primarily negative genetic correlations. So negative correlations between anorexia and fasting insulin, insulin resistance, type two diabetes. So in other words, we're saying some of the same genetic factors that increase your risk of developing anorexia nervosa place you at decreased risk for developing type two diabetes. Um, same genes working in different directions. The only positive genetic correlation that we saw on the metabolic panel side was with HDL cholesterol, which is really the only favorable metabolic parameter that we looked at um, in, this, um, in this GWAS. And then finally, the bottom part of that graph is genetic correlations between anorexia and anthropometric or body measurement factors. And Honestly, this made me sort of rewrite my own personal narrative about what anorexia is. Um, because in the past, people would say, you know, is anorexia nervosa sort of just the opposite of obesity or people living in larger bodies? And I always responded, no, anorexia nervosa is a psychiatric disorder. Um, it's not a metabolic condition. Well, I was wrong. Um, and, you know, this really shows very strong negative correlations between anorexia nervosa and fat mass, 
BMI, overweight, waist, waist to hip ratio, all of these anthropometric measures. So people who are at increased risk or de of developing anorexia nervosa are at decreased genetic risk of developing obesity. So there's a component to this illness that exists outside of that top right-hand corner that is the psychiatric component. And this has really led to considerable discussion and asking the question, you know, are we to the point or what do we need to do um, to decide if we need to think about anorexia nervosa as a metabopsychiatric disorder? On the pro side, the dietitians tell us this is not surprising to them at all. Um, basically, they've been telling us this forever. Um, and you know, one of the questions has always been, how can people with anorexia reach and maintain such a low BMI, such a low weight, when most people have difficulty with taking a few pounds off and keeping them off? Um, what about this predictable low weight relapse after inadequate renourishment? If someone gets kicked out of the hospital too soon and they haven't been able to stabilize at a healthy body mass index, um, I can guarantee you that they're gonna go back out and their body is gonna pull them back down to a low weight again. Could it explain the hypermetabolic period? Um, is it a way of understanding why family-based treatment works so well? FBT is basically a non-negotiation approach where the parents take over renourishment of the child, um, acknowledging that a person with severe anorexia nervosa doesn't have the ability um, to decide what they should eat. And parents also say that um, often when their child develops anorexia, it's like a, a switch flipped. Um, one day they were like sort of normal in the sense of this was my child that I've known for years. And then suddenly there was a flip and something else kicked in. And whether that's related to the under, underlying metabolic part is unclear. Now on the cons, anorexia isn't the only psychiatric disorder with metabolic genetic correlations. OCD often seems to go in the same direction, but what we don't know is how much of that same direction is actually due to comorbid cases of OCD and anorexia. And we also don't know what the metabolic mechanisms are yet. Um, and that's really the critical next step to, to understand what is going on um, in, in metabolism, in whatever it is that determines what our body size and shape is going to be um, that is dysfunctional in anorexia nervosa. And what about the other eating disorders? Um, I'll start off by saying we do not have GWASs for bulimia or binge eating disorder. So I'm going to take you through another study that looks at it in a different way. It is not as definitive as a GWAS is, but it gives us the first glimpse genetically of what might be different between or among anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. And this is from another group of researchers um, that I worked with, Nadia Makali. Um, the study that you're going to hear about was done by Chris Hubel, was, who was one of Jerome Breen's and my PhD students and is now a postdoc. Um, and we're going to talk about um, a polygenic risk score. Um, and this is going to be more conceptual rather than going into the, the depths of calculating a polygenic risk score. But once again, um, we're looking at the information that is below the significance line. And basically what we're doing is we're creating a single score um, that can be applied to anyone to say, what is the weighted sum of their risk for developing a particular trait? And just briefly, the way you do that is you have a discovery sample, a large discovery sample in which you do your GWAS. And from that, you develop a polygenic risk score um, that you can then apply to a target sample to figure out how high the people in that particular sample are on the, on the trait that you're looking at. And here, um, we're basically showing the distribution. And one of the things that we're really interested in, and this is another talk, but we're super interested in the people who have a disorder, but actually have low polygenic risk um, versus people who have high polygenic risk and don't have the disorder for the trait that you're looking at. In fact, we're doing a study in Sweden right now where we're interviewing people on the extremes of the polygenic risk distribution to try to understand if there are clinical differences um, in their phenotypes. 
But then what we did is um, Chris went to the um, UK Biobank and identified all the people with anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or binge eating disorder. So first thing to notice is the sample sizes are much smaller than what we saw in, um, the, in the GWAS. So keep that in mind. All of this is fairly preliminary. This is a different type of grass, although, although we've laid it out the same way. So we have psych psychiatric traits in the top, metabolic traits in the middle, and anthropometric traits on the bottom. But here, what we're looking at is odds ratios. And what we did was we took those samples of people with anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder, and we looked at their odds ratios for the PRSs of these different traits. Um, so again, the next three slides are gonna be more conceptual than specific, but we're gonna break it down in the same way. So here, binge eating disorder is purple, Bulimia is sort of magenta and anorexia nervosa is light turquoise. And what I want you to look at is how much these three different colors hang together in this particular graph. Um, and if they're filled in, those were the only ones that were significant. Um, and that's important to remember because they were fairly small sample sizes. Now I'm gonna point some things out here. What I'm gonna point out is for the most part in the psychiatric disorders, Anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder, they pretty much hang together on the right side, on the positive odds ratios above one, meaning that they all have positive, um, significantly elevated odds ratios for the polygenic risk scores of schizophrenia, PTSD, autism, bipolar disorder, et cetera, with some exceptions. And some of the exceptions are binge eating disorder and bulimia were significantly positively associated with autism, anorexia was lower, which is sort of contrary to some of the literature. And we also saw some separation with PTSD and obsessive compulsive disorder, but the circles aren't filled in. They're not significant. We're just looking at directions of effects at this time. So from this picture, I would by and large say that for the most part, anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder tend to be positively associated with other psychiatric disorders. The next panel is the metabolic panel. And even without me drawing the lines, you can start to see that there's a bit of a shift. So we'll start with binge eating disorder, positive association with type two diabetes, negative with HDL cholesterol, positive for fasting insulin. And then you can see a switch in different directions for anorexia nervosa and bulimia just tended to be all negatively associated with these three. And I don't want you to try to interpret this. Um, I just want you to look at this as a first glimpse and an underpowered glimpse um, of how these three disorders might be separating somewhat on the metabolic side. No significant differences, but the directions of the effect, effect differ. And then here, I think again, without even putting the boxes up, you can see that we're seeing um, with the anthropometric measures, we see bulimia and binge eating disorder. And here, significant over on the right side and anorexia nervosa much more over on the, on the left side. And this very much mirrors what we saw in the GWAS, the negative association um, between anorexia nervosa and all of these anthropometric traits, whereas both bulimia and especially binge eating disorder tend to have positive associations um, or significantly elevated odds ratios um, in the UK biobank. So again, just a glimpse of things to come, um, but a suggestion, um, oh yeah, I was just gonna say, the only difference that seems to be quite different is age at menarche um, being much lower in um, binge eating disorder than the other two. So the title of the paper was One Size Does Not Fit All. Um, anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder tend to be broadly similarly associated with polygenic risk scores for psychiatric traits, but the differences start emerging in the polygenic risk scores for metabolic and anthropometric traits. And a GWAS of bulimia and binge eating disorder are coming soon. Um, and hopefully we will also get GWASs of ARFID and atypical anorexia nervosa so we can complete the genetic picture of all of the eating disorders. And this might be what it looks like in the future, hypothesizing that ARFID might be more closely related to anorexia genetically and bulimia and binge eating disorder might be more closely related. So PRSs, where are we going with those in the future? 
Um, one question is, can we improve risk assessment by combining polygenic risk scores with other measures of risk to see who is at risk for developing these illnesses? Can they help us make a diagnosis or make clinical decisions? Um, you know, if we're not sure um, if someone has anorexia nervosa or not, can a PRS sort of augment our clinical decision-making? Are psychiatric PRS associated with treatment response? We're not doing that great still when it comes to the treatment of anorexia nervosa. Um, you know, hopefully at some point we'll be able to match patients um, with different interventions, but in the eating disorders right now, A, um, we don't know enough genetically, and B, uh, we don't have enough interventions to actually try that with. But the one that I think is closer on the horizon are our polygenic risk scores associated with adverse physical health outcomes and mental illnesses. And the one that comes to mind is you know, really problematic weight gain with some of the newer antipsychotic medications. Um, if we can predict ahead of time that someone's likely to have just terrible weight gain that could really put them at risk for other problems, then we might want to go to a different medication to avoid that outcome. And so you saw our first freeze. We're in the middle of another freeze. Melissa Munchernoff at the UNC side and yet Termershausen and the um, Karolinska side are currently working on the second freeze um, in which we're increasing our anorexia sample size by oh, 9,500 cases. And we're gonna do a binge eating GWAS, so not a disorder, but a cross cutting symptom of binge eating that cuts across anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. Um, to try to figure out what the genetic architecture of that symptom looks like. That should be out next month. Now, just briefly, um, I wanna talk about what we do with this information now. Um, personally, I think it's our responsibility not just to do the science, but to package the information appropriately for patients and families. Um, I think all of us as clinicians should integrate genetics into our own case conceptualizations and we should develop at least comfort with answering patients and parents' questions. Um, not expected to become a geneticist. I'm not a geneticist, um, but I think it's becoming pretty much of everybody, but everybody's vocabulary when they talk about psychiatric disorders. Uh, but also know your limits, consult a genetic counselor. We're hoping to be creating more genetic counselors who are able to really work with psychiatric disorders and help people understand the complexity behind the genetics and the environmental contribution, contributions to psychiatric disorders. And above all else, don't perpetuate misinformation. Erase all that stuff that you used to think you know about eating disorders and replace it with some of the novel information that you're hearing today. And the other thing we talk about is underscoring that genetics is just one piece of the risk puzzle. And I'll show you a little way of talking about that in a second. Um, that all or nothing thinking, whenever I hear somebody say genes or environment or nature or nurture, I stop them and I get them to replace that or with an and, um, because for psychiatric disorders, it's both, and we need to think about both. Um, people have challenges understanding probabilities, um, but we really do have to get them to embrace complexity. And we also have to watch out for people interpreting this as meaning that it's genetic destiny. You know, if I had genetic risk for anorexia, my child's going to have genetic risk for anorexia. That's not, that's not helpful and it's not accurate. And also genetic guilt. Uh, parents have been made to feel so guilty in this field for so long. Um, the last thing they need is to feel guilty about their genetic contribution, because really that is the, one of the very few things in the world that we have absolutely no control over. And eating disorders are genetics, not psychological. Um, they're both. Um, and right now, the psychological part is what we really need to address in order to affect change and get people well. Um, and also watch out for genetic simplification. You know, I have the gene for anorexia, or I'm going to pass down the gene for bulimia. Much more complicated. And we're not after a genetic test. Um, and I think that's one of the things where industry is getting far out ahead of the science, saying that they can actually do genetic tests for anorexia nervosa. If anyone tells you that that's the case, or they have one, or if they want to take your money to do one, um, it's not true because that's not the way it works. And we're not close to anything like that. And are not really aiming for that in our science. This is what I use with, with parents and with patients sometimes. Um, it's not perfect. It has its limits but it at least gets the point across. And what I talk about is your risk for developing an eating disorder comes from four sources. 
It comes from the genetic risk. And that's really all we've talked about up till now today. Um, but also there are genetic protective factors. You know, you get 50% of your genes from the sperm, 50% of the genes from the egg, and we might be able to trace the genetic risk, the genetic risk factors, but we do not have a handle on any of the genes that might buffer those or silence them. Um, and we're not even talking about epigenetic factors yet. So we've got genetic risk factors, genetic protective factors, environmental risk factors. You know, we still have problems with the impact of bullying, the impact of extreme dieting, the impact of sports that emphasize thinness. Um, all of these go into the environmental risk bucket, but also environmental protective factors. Um, you know, things that can buffer you against those onslaughts of environmental risk factors. You know, a close family, um, a coach that emphasizes strength instead of thinness um, or body size or shape. Um, your risk really depends on all four of these things. You're born with your spades and your clubs, can't do anything about that. Um, and parents can't protect their children against all the environmental risk factors. And what we're trying to do in therapy is to boost the hearts um, and reduce the impact of the diamonds. And of course, with some traits, um, there are also, you know, genes, rare variants, um, but if you have them, your risk of developing the disorder is much greater, um, or maybe even 100%. Um, we have found none of those in anorexia nervosa yet. Um, we will still be looking, um, but as of now, the spades, the clubs, the hearts, and the diamonds are a fair enough way to talk about the complexity of an individual's risk for illness. So what are we doing? And this is my last bit before we open up for some questions. Um, you heard about ANGIE, um, the Anorexia Nervosa Genetics Initiative. We have now pivoted that to EDGY, the Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative um, that broadens ANGIE out in several ways. Um, and EDGY is looking at anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, hopefully ARFID, um, and in some countries, atypical AN. Um, the, what's happening with EDGY is our global goal is 100,000 patients, and I think we're going to make it. Um, we're asking the same questionnaires around the world. So we have a battery of questionnaires that we have translated professionally into other languages so that other countries can hop on board easily um, and develop their own EDGY sites. We're diversifying samples. I'll tell you more about that in a sec. Um, we're using digital consent and questionnaires and at-home saliva collection. And Angie, everybody had to donate blood. Um, and we still got 17,000 people. Um, but now things have moved so quickly that we can do at-home saliva collection at the next pop in the post and send back to us. We've engaged the advocacy com community and we're engaging clinicians so that we're really creating a community of patients, parents, advocates, clinicians, and researchers to address these scientific questions. Now, what you heard before is work based almost entirely on European ancestry populations. And it is essential to have representation from diverse populations to ensure that we do not perpetuate or amplify health disparities in order to fully account for the impact of both genes and environment. If, for example, again, project yourself into the future and imagine that we develop some genetic, or we identify some genetic pathways that lead to a drug discovery that address that particular biological aberration. If that was discovered on the basis of a completely European ancestry population, we do not have any guarantee that, that those same genes and that same pathway are necessarily operative in other ancestries, in people of African ancestry and people of Asian ancestry. So by doing that work, we have the potential to actually make um, inadequate or unequal care even worse and to amplify health disparities. Um, so we have a huge push now to make sure that we're looking at eating disorders as they live in the world, not just based on our preconceived notion of who gets them and what they look like. So we're looking across biological sex at birth, gender identity, weights and shapes, genetic ancestry, culture, and socioeconomic backgrounds. We talked about the genes, but there's also no guarantee that the environmental precipitants are the same across different um, cultures. So we really have to do this well to fully understand eating disorders. We're not just assessing eating disorders. 
we're assessing all of these domains, life events, trauma, physical activity, OCD, alcohol and drug use, tobacco use, anxiety, depression, and treatment history. And what will be wonderful about this, for example, is we can call our partners, the PGC OCD group, and we can combine our data. So we can really dig more deeply into that genetic correlation that I showed you to figure out more about which genes actually co-influence both anorexia and OCD. And the same with all of the other working groups for all of the other phenotypes. This is what happened. NIH, NIMH started it. NIMH um, funds EDGY in the United States, Denmark, New Zealand, and Australia. Then the name cut on and EDGY UK kicked in. They're funded by the National Health Research um, in the UK. And then Sweden kicked in. Uh, the Swedish Research Council is funding EDGY Sweden. And then suddenly EDGY Mexico and EDGY Italy kicked in and they both received funding from their own countries. And then um, we got a grant to do EDGY Taiwan, um, which one of my junior faculty members is starting up um, and, and EDGY Netherlands started. And now we're working on EDGY Canada and EDGY Ecuador. And it seems like every week another country comes in and said, can we be an edgy site too? And we have this wonderful package that we can just clone, give to them. If it's already translated into that language, they can use it. Otherwise, we just get it professionally, um, professionally translated. And suddenly we've got a global study where everyone is getting the same phenotyping and the same procedures. Um, and that's why I think we're going to make it to 100,000. So why? Um, we wanna understand the shared and unique biology of anorexia, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and eventually atypical anorexia and ARFID. Um, we really wanna destigmatize these disorders. We wanna erase the myths back to Gloria Steinem's unlearning that I talked about in the very beginning. Um, participant feedback has been so positive. Um, people I know who have done these, this kind of work in other fields, you know, ask me, they're like, you know, our patients have never been this excited. You know, your patients are really excited. And like influencers reach out to us and say, you know, can we help amplify your message about edgy? Um, and we're super happy to have anybody involved um, who can reach people that we can't typically reach with the reach um, of an academic center. The goal is to move toward personalized medicine approach um, instead of the one, one size fits all treatment that we tend to have now. Um, and eventually, hopefully, maybe drug repositioning or development based on genetic results. Right now, we have one medication that's FDA approved for bulimia. That's Prozac. It happened years ago. Um, Lizdex amphetamine is approved for binge eating disorder. Um, and anorexia and ARFID, we've got nothing. There are no medications that work, and there are definitely no medications that actually target the underlying biology of the illness. So hopefully this information will feed forward um, to allow us to develop those sorts of medications. We're also creating a large global participant legacy for research recontact. We want to improve outcomes um, and ultimately eliminate mortality. Um, mortality from anorexia nervosa is still inexcusably high. Um, and we need to do something about that. And these are my teams. Um, so up on the top, um, not my team, the top is the Eating Disorders Working Group, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. Um, down on the left side is the UNC SEED team um, and our annual Walk for Hope. And over on the right is the Karolinska um, SEDI team. And I invite you all um, to amplify us, to follow us. Um, we've got stuff on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and yep, we even have taken a dive into TikTok um, to talk about edgy so that we can reach the broadest um, amount of people possible to spread the word about edgy and to boost participation and to figure out ways to treat these disorders better and to eliminate mortality. And at that, I'll finish up and open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bulick. Um, that was an amazing talk. I'm going to be begin the question and answer session. Um, to ask a question, um, click on the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom and type in the question. Um, the first one is um, comments that it's interesting that years of education was being positively correlated with, with some of the eating disorders. Um, years of education tends to improve health and health, uh, health outcomes. So uh, this. Uh, person was wondering if you had thoughts as to why there might be such an association that 
like the one you found. Yeah, interesting, interesting question. And I think um, the way it was phrased suggests perhaps that um, education um, on a general level makes one make better choices, have the, the ability to actually buy, for example, foods that are more healthy, those sorts of things. That makes perfect sense. Um, what we're actually talking about here though is the genetic correlation. Um, so we're not talking about the phenotypic side of things. I think this is really hard to keep in mind. You know, we're actually talking about the fact that some of the same genes that make you more likely to have a higher educational outcome also make you more likely to develop anorexia nervosa. Um, so I think both, both things can be true. What I just said can be true and um, the impact of education on outcome on a phenotypic level can also be true. Yeah, that's, that's a really good interest. Uh, Hard thing to keep in mind, I think. Is yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> um, so in the beginning of your talk, you had kind of showed that work. Um, I think it was one of your postdocs, but I can't remember um, about the kind of the longitudinal um, uh, or the eating disorders over time and that yeah. it wasn't necessarily anorexia, didn't stay anorexia, et cetera. Um, so how would you overlay all of the GWAS and the polygenic risk score kind of over that and explain the non-continuity, I yeah. guess? That's a great question. Um, and you know, that is one of our biggest clinical dilemmas when someone walks into our office for the first time. You know, just imagine that someone comes into our office for the first time at age 11 with anorexia nervosa. You know, right now, we can't predict if that person's gonna have sort of like a short course and they're gonna get well, if they're gonna develop sort of long-term severe and enduring anorexia nervosa, or if they're gonna sort of like transition or migrate to bulimia nervosa. So, you know, one of the things that I imagine is if someone, if that person comes in in the future, we could genotype them. And if it looks like they have a high polygenic risk score for bulimia, um, we might wanna be really careful, for example, in how quickly we re-nourish them. Um, because you, you know, we've heard stories and we've seen for years, people who go into the hospital with anorexia and then, develop bulimia because they're eating so much to get it so that they can gain weight and get out of the hospital. Um, that might be particular pro particularly problematic for someone with a high polygenic risk score for bulimia. Um, so, you know, I think the goal might be to use polygenic risk scores to predict what kind of a course and what kind of crisscrossing a person is most likely to have. That'd be great if we can end up doing that. Um, Kind of back to a clinical question. Um, what are the behavioral differences between anorexia nervosa and ARFID? Mm, right. So the big distinction between the two um, is that ARFID does not have a focus on weight and shape. Um, and, you know, ARFID is, you know, we're still learning so much about it. Um, but we made sure, for example, in that Swedish twin study that I showed you, that we excluded all people who had a lot of body image, um, body dissatisfaction or drive for thinness. Um, you know, it was either anxiety led, it was someone might have had sort of a, a trauma in the past, they might have choked or had difficulty doing that, um, or this other group where people just have low interest. They just seem to be disinterested in, in food. Um, and Though again, you know, I think this is this is one of the things that we get so used to with eating disorders. Those aren't mutually exclusive categories. We see a lot of over overlap um, in in people with ARFID, not just children, but adults with ARFID as well that might have components of all three. Um, there's kind of a follow up question about ARFID or a related question, I guess. Um, uh, mentioning that they see a lot of ARFID with people on the autistic spectrum and wondering if that's the case um, and if you might have any insights as to why that might be. Yeah, that's, that's actually one of the things um, we really want to look at. You know, we don't have an ARFID GWAS yet, um, but one of the things that we can do, as you saw in those genetic correlations, um, as we can see maybe if, let's just say we do a big GWAS of ARFID, um, and in there, we have people who are more on the loss of interest side, the anxiety side, the trauma side, um, and we can position um, where ARFID actually belongs vis-a-vis -vis eating disorders and the autism spectrum genetically. You know, and, and I think that's one of the ways that I think about this is I think about you know, each, each homogeneous cluster um, within a disorder being more like a cloud 
um, you know, that gets a little bit less dense as you get to the outer circles. And then we can yeah. see what those clouds overlap with. Um, and, you know, I think I actually have um, I'm co supervising another postdoc in the UK backwards. So he's starting with neurodevelopmental disorders and then looking at eating disorders in folks who have primary neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, you know, and it, it's like, again, it's these, you know, I call them bridge people. Um, you know, these people who are bold enough to, you know, anchor their careers across two different fields, um, who I think are really starting to create the narrative of how we're gonna understand psychiatric disorders in the future, not as distinct, sometimes overlapping categories, but you know, as these meaningful clouds that really do give us information about holy ideology of different traits. It'd be really exciting to see what, what they find with their work. Um, are there, I'm not sure what this is, but maybe you'd know. Um, is there any future plans for EDGY to look at genetic risk in conjunction with gut dysbiosis as far as whether microbial influence may act as a risk or protective factor for ED development? Yep, that's another talk. Um, so <laughs> we actually just got a bunch of data. Okay, I'll, I'll unpack this a little bit more. So in between Angie and EDGY, um, there was a study called BEGIN, um, which was the binge eating genetics initiative. Um, both in the US and in Sweden, um, we collected genotypes and poop samples. Um, and so we, in fact, we just got a whole bunch of data back yesterday in Sweden um, from shotgun metagenomics. Um, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, combining um, that information um, to understand the impact of host genomics on the microbiome um, and also just to characterize the microbiome across the different eating disorders. Um, Ian Carroll, one of my colleagues here at UNC, and I did one study um, on anorexia nervosa that was also funded by NIMH, and we identified um, a dysbiosis um, in anorexia nervosa of gut. Um, and I think it makes, if you just think about it, it makes perfect sense. You know, we have all these inhabitants in our gut, but if you have anorexia nervosa, you create a very specific type of environment um, and not one that all bugs can live off of. So, you know, the bacteria that can survive in a starvation state are very different than the ones who might survive in the guts of someone, for example, who has binge eating disorder. Um, and so those are the questions we're trying to answer, but that would definitely take another hour. <laughs> have to schedule another hour. So <laughs> there you go. Next year. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think one more question. Um, and I think you've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but um, in case you want to elaborate, do you think that these GWAS studies um, and polygenic resource risk score studies um, will for more targeted therapies in the future? I really hope they do. Um, you know, and, and, and it really, it, it wounds me almost um, that we don't have any medications that are effective for anorexia nervosa. I think it is one of the saddest disorders that we work with in psychiatry. I mean, so many disorders in psychiatry, you know, are bundled with sadness and the impact on the individual and on the family. Um, but families that I've worked with whose you know, offspring or whose partners have had anorexia just go through, they go through such living hell with this illness. Um, and we continue to do them a disservice by um, not advancing our treatments fast enough, by, by not being able to re-nourish them in a way that is enduring, um, you know, by, by helping them not um, die by suicide, which is the second reason that people with anorexia nervosa die. Um, you know, I think Walt Kay and I had a paper that, um, an opinion that we wrote in um, JAMA Psychiatry a couple months ago about the crisis of care in anorexia nervosa. And, and it is a crisis. Um, and I think we need more we need more brains working on this problem. And we need more brains from different areas, not the same people doing the same thing over and over again, but we need to engage scientists and clinicians from different, just different areas to think about this problem, to accelerate the field. Because, um, you know, are we paddling as fast as we can? I'm not convinced we are, um, but we owe it to our patients and our parents to do more and do better. Thank you so much. I think I'll turn it back to Christine now.
Thank you, Dr. You're Spott, for moderating the question and answer. Um, and thank you to Dr. Mulek for your excellent and thought-provoking presentation. I think that's illustrated by all the questions that were coming in uh, fast and furious. Um, and thanks to all of you who joined us and participated in the Q&A. Um, if you have colleagues who are unable to join and are interested in this topic, remind them that a recording of today's webinar will be available in about one month on the OBSSR website at obssr.od.nih.gov. Uh, the next OBSSR Director's Webinar will be held on July 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and will feature Dr. Irene Dunkel-Mullen, who will present on her most recent paper titled, A Proposed Framework on Integrating Health Equity and Racial Justice into the Artificial Intelligence Development Life Cycle. So I think that'll be another excellent topic. Um, please subscribe to the OBSSR listserv to receive updates on upcoming events, again, at obssr.od.nih.gov. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much for attending, and I hope you all have a great day. And thank you, Dr. Buellick. Bye.